what I've been doing over the last few months is attempting to convince people that we're facing an issue that's as important and as unprecedented as climate change. And I call it mind change because I think there's certain parallels. With mind change, the issue is how the new technologies, the new environment of two dimensions, might be impacting on the human mind and changing the way especially young generations may be thinking and feeling. I'm often seen as a kind of techno luddite, so I'd like to say from the outset that there are certain beneficial issues. For example, you only have to look at MIT and the states who've put all their courses on the web for anyone to access and download, although they can't register for a degree. There's some interesting evidence that perhaps a higher IQ, which has been witnessed over the last decade or so, might be linked to a facility with computer games because one is rehearsing the same type of skills. Visual motor skills uh, may be improved again by rehearsal of interaction with the screen. But my concern are those issues that are being overlooked or conflated possibly um, in a more general way. For example, learning. Let's think about learning. Some people say learning is going to be improved with access to the screen because indubitably you can access facts. But information and accessing facts is not really knowledge. It's not understanding. And I fear that sometimes there may be such an enthusiasm for being bombarded with facts that people think that automatically, along with the facts and the ability that we can respond to those facts quickly if we wish, comes understanding. And I think it's quite the opposite. My own view is that understanding involves hooking up one fact with another. Facts on their own are pretty boring, but when they are compared one with another, that's when you start to develop ideas. And I fear that this enthusiasm for learning and information may be missing out the quintessential ingredient of understanding. Another issue I'm worried about is gaming. I think it's a very dangerous lesson to learn that actions don't have consequences, that someone can be undead. In real life, this is not the case. You may be sorry for what you've done. Uh, you may be able to change your ways. Uh, you may be able to do things that can compensate for what's happened, but you can't rub it out of the space-time continuum. You can't pretend it's not there. When you play a game, someone can be undead again. And I fear that this may be a rather dangerous lesson to learn. And if you're doing such activities all the time, i.e. doing things that don't have consequences, I would argue they don't have meaning. And if you're doing something that doesn't have meaning, what would that say about you? Inevitably, uh, I have my detractors. Um, and one of the most common complaints is that there's no evidence for what I'm saying. And I think I've got several ways really of addressing that. Um, first, of course, is absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. As witness the smoking in the 50s, that was the mantra of the tobacco companies that there wasn't any evidence. So that's the first issue. Second, as a neuroscientist, I think there is evidence certainly that the brain will adapt and therefore it's not an unreasonable assumption that it will adapt in a way that is uh, equipped to survive almost as though it's a computer itself in a two-dimensional world where fast responses are mandated in response to stimulation rather than in a thought. That's... Third, there is actually evidence accumulating. There's Nicholas Carr's The Shallows, there's Richard Watson's Future Minds, there's Sherry Turkle's Alone Together. There's a brilliant review by Daphne Bavallier in the very high impact journal Neuron from last year, uh, where she suggested that there was a tendency now for increased in distraction, uh, violence and addiction um, related to screen technologies. Now, of course, one swallow doesn't make a summer and one can go through all the literature and find fault with some of the studies and show their shortcomings, of course. But we must do this. We must have the debate. I think the other issue that we mustn't uh, ignore is trends. Now, um, I know that's not evidence, but I think trends are telling us something. And one trend is there's a tripling of prescriptions for drugs for attention deficit disorder. Now, this could mean that drugs are being prescribed more liberally. It could mean that the condition is being medicalized and recognized. Or it might just mean that perhaps uh, we are putting very small children in a scenario that mandates a short attention span so that when they go to school, they will fidget. And therefore, perhaps in certain cases, they may be diagnosed as having ADHD. Now, the same issue also can apply possibly to the increase in diagnosis for autism. And this is a very controversial issue. And I'd like to say that I want to stress it's there's an increase in diagnosis of autism. And no one seems to know why. I would like those who purport that it is entirely genetic to show or have evidence that it is due to simply that there's increased numbers of diagnosis. But my own view is it's not so much that autism is a single condition, but more that if you have someone who spends their life 
um, not looking people in the eye, not learning how to hug someone, who uh, puts a premium on action speaking louder than words, that that might encourage, and I do stress might, autistic-like behaviour.